Day Monk, your Prairie Monk, WFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial. And uh, it's, I think it's the 17th uh, tomorrow, Sunday, when you will hear this, will be the 18th of July 9, 2021. Okay, uh, and today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, people who do interesting things. Uh, and it runs into our discussion of uh, how we encourage people to be volunteers to a known heritage and then perhaps to become a, a CEO or a, an organizer of uh, knowledge about a certain topic, whether it be music or outdoor prairies or rivers or what have you we short on those sorts of people but uh, i uh, find it productive to be talking to people and we have now a, a, a re uh, organization of uh, music uh, on friday night and uh, usually two bands uh, right outside the door of weft and uh, People meet each other. They're so overjoyed to be uh, back in action. Uh, so, uh, uh, one of those instances it was, let me hold a moment. Got to keep my time here. And uh, so uh, I was taking uh, materials. Let me say that uh, I have a lot to do with salvage, and often I'm left salvage that is interesting and uh, productive. Uh, and it's for sort of for thought that I might have some way of uh, uh, redirecting it so that people could use it. It's not always the case. Sometimes it sits around and waits for a while. Uh, but I had uh, uh, theatrical closing and uh, goodies that had been left with me for a while. And I delivered them, but I encountered a, someone who knew Market Street. They knew Weft. They knew, they had worked on the front windows of Weft. And, and uh, they had this history there. His, his mother had had a bookstore and uh, just uh, talking back and forth uh, was enough to uh, hook up your spirits because uh, you know that there are people around who have thoughts and ideas and you have to have some way of sharing them and music brings people together. And uh, beer will bring people together too. So we have restaurants in the street and we have some beer in the street and, and we have music. And uh, then we have people and it's amazing. I watch a, a little gal who's probably no more than two feet high uh, leading a dog on a leash. The dog was almost twice the size of the, uh, as a gal that was uh, bring the dog along and uh, the dog was very friendly and if told to sit it would sit and uh, it, it would enjoy and uh, so that sort of interaction is interesting uh, somebody put up a, a a sign which was a triangle and so children who were small enough were willing to get in under the sign and and hide uh, some would dance and uh, even some of the WEF people would dance and uh, some would surveil looking over to see that beer didn't go out past the zone of where we were working uh, 
I just had a, a long conversation with uh, Doug DeLong. He is a, an engineer, works with the state and regions, and uh, he is doing prairie work as a, uh, originally a Moultrie County engineer. He was uh, organizing railroad right, right of ways that I thought could be a prairie right away. And uh, now, 20 years later, it has grown. And he was calling me uh, about a blue flower, which is, I know is Veronica. Uh, and uh, we got to be talking and uh, figuring out uh, how he might uh, be able to sell prairie seed. Uh, it is not an awfully lucrative game, but it's interesting. And Prairie Moon, especially in southern Minnesota, has done very well. Uh, there's a limit to what you can do. There are just uh, millions of bacteria and fungi out there. There are uh, insects galore. There are birds that seem to have survived from the dinosaur era. Uh, there are people who volunteer people who watch things and uh, so we talked about plants and their shade so some plants would like to be under a forest a uh, wild ginger would like to do that uh, uh, but other plants that come in spring uh, will uh, wilt away when the canopy comes over, but their roots will be there for next year. Uh, we talked about our only shrub, which is a Cynosis uh, or, or New Jersey tea. And New Jersey tea uh, has a, is a shrub. It's a very low shrub, so you hardly recognize it as different from the perennial plants in the prairie. But it has this spread of uh, about a six feet diameter of red roots. And when uh, farmers were plowing for the first time, uh, this root would uh, block the plow and break the plow. So John Deere and others had to develop a stump jump plow uh, that would, when it hit something like this or a stump where a tree had been taken out, the, the plow would move up and over and come back down again. Uh, <coughs> so <coughs> uh, could that be a, a plant that Doug could plant and, and provide to seed companies? Uh, can it be grown in the raw? Probably not because especially if you have legumes uh, deer and other creatures are going to be uh, very aware that you have plants that have nutriment and uh, and if you're going to have a seed for instance you have to get there before the insects because they know that there's proteinaceous material there and you have to be lucky to have a soil that has uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria if you're going to deal with legumes uh, and the interaction between the roots of the plants is very little known so if you want to join the preservation crowd and and do interesting things with prairie you have to know a little bit about the 110 broadleaf plants and about six grasses. And does it grow quickly? No. If you grow Indian grass, it can come in within the, the season. But if you're going to plant uh, perennial plants, which most of the prairie is, then you, you're going to take three, five years before you have a decent little prairie that you can sort of see as a prairie. And then you probably have to wait till 10 years to get a more uh, mature prairie. Uh, you may have to have a greenhouse to uh, 
develop plants so that you can plant them out a little on the material side so they don't get gobbled up by the deer. You have to uh, socialize with the deer. Your land is probably not your land, it's their land, and that you're the invader rather than they. So do you have to put a fence around it? Do you have to, uh, how, how, how do you organize this? Uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Well, I've been reading a, a book uh, about Mayo Clinic. I have various people who have gone to Rochester, Minnesota to, to uh, have an operation. And there's a story behind this. A, it goes back to probably about the 1830s when uh, 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 a guy named Mayo, his parents, I think, were working people, but he was working his way west, and uh, uh, he realized that uh, he, he would have to have qualifications, and he was uh, interested in becoming a doctor. The qualifications were very few and far between, but he would get to work with people, get some apprenticeship, and be able to put up a shingle as a doctor. He didn't do that very much because uh, going west in the 1830s, 40s, 50s was uh, a challenge. There were many doctors, many people who said they were doctors. Some of them were charlatans that weren't doctors, but were taking advantage of people who uh, didn't have other uh, medical uh, answers and uh, he, he started to explore the Wisconsin and Minnesota and uh, almost out to the Dakotas and uh, figure out where he wanted to settle down. I'm not sure exactly why he ended up in uh, uh, Rochester, Minnesota. It's about probably a hundred miles southeast of Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I said, it was a smallish town. Uh, he liked that. He took on other jobs and occasionally would do something of a medical di uh, situation uh, and solve it. Uh, so he, he developed a clientele despite the fact that there were other doctors in the area. And he was rather good at this. Uh, first, most of the, the answers were uh, chemicals, uh, whether you were willing to take a, a laxative or uh, whether something you took, uh, some food would uh, improve your situation. Uh, some inhalation uh, would stop croup, for instance. Uh, uh, but then there were people who broke legs or uh, had infected uh, wounds. Uh, and gradually, uh, Mr. Mayo Sen Sr. Uh, found ways of, of actually uh, cutting out pieces of uh, cancer, uh, goiters. Uh, women were having problems with uh, growths that would get on their fallopian tubes or on their uterus. And as, uh, in a cyst-like manner, they would grow and fill with water. So he got to... Uh, drain those cysts uh, and he had uh, no real uh, operating theater. He would go to people's houses. It was a horse era, so he either had to ride a horse uh, or go in a sulky. It was easier to do with the horse because the sulky could break down on the route and there you were. 
there were no trains yet, so he, he couldn't hop on the train and go to somewhere. He was mostly working with local people, and uh, that was friendly, and uh, uh, he could join uh, different uh, agencies in town and uh, be a real person. He, he married uh, someone who had similar thoughts, and eventually she got to be part of the Mayo Clinic too. Uh, and they had two sons, and they became very famous, and so did father. Uh, so with persistence, he created a place to operate if people could come to him. Uh, there was sometimes a small battle as to whether people should come to him or somewhere else, but he had a reputation for being successful and not having a uh, high death rate. Uh, and then there was a convent that was nearby and he needed a hospital and uh, the, the convent was mainly interested in teaching, but could they take on nursing responsibilities? That was a possibility. The woman in charge, the mother superior was willing to to give that a go and it was successful so people would come and and they would have operating rooms and the, uh, the women were the assistants and sometimes when the doctors were out of town the the women got to be able to do things uh, that were rather serious and but very helpful uh, and uh, uh, they got to expand this uh, convent and they were in behind the, that there were the Mayo people who were uh, Protestant in background, but they were quite willing and interested to work with a Catholic population. But some of the population that was being served was not sure about uh, this sort of relationship, but uh, they also knew that the, the success rate was there. If it was a broken bone, the broken bone was likely to repair uh, itself. And uh, so that father got to be uh, knowledgeable and he would go off to other places in Europe and England and uh, uh, and learn how to do new procedures, uh, which were very rare for uh, the West, where people were heading west, but the, they weren't in the uh, time frame to to build hospitals and have doctors and well health. Uh, if you made a mistake with your axe and hurt a leg, you may just have to have the leg amputated. Uh, with gangrene, and uh, that's uh, that's not an easy thing if you didn't have ether or chloroform. But, uh, so the doctor's wife got to be the person who administered the chloroform, and uh, chloroform was slower but better than ether and she got to know what the details were and she got to know when people were coming out of uh, anesthesia and and so it was interesting to see that these were women who were not just at home or uh, secretaries or or school teachers or uh, they weren't uh, categorized for what they do and, and they did things very well and they expanded and they expanded again and and then the royal opposition came in with uh, 
a, a, a different hospital which was more Protestant in style, but the people still went to uh, the, the uh, Mayo Elder. Well, then came the two boys, there were the girls too, uh, and both seemed to be involved to some extent, but the, the two boys were destined to be future doctors. And even at the early age of teenaging, they were helping to assist in operations and uh, uh, they got to be very knowledgeable. One was older and more uh, uh, bookish, but also able to present their case for doing things. And uh, he would go to meetings and uh, his younger brother was equally involved in discovering different types of operations and uh, he he was more folksy. He was able to talk his way through things that he didn't know about, but thought they ought to experiment with. And their survival rate was uh, high and higher than the, the people who were around. So uh, the population grew and the elder son went off to a medical school. There weren't too many medical schools. It, uh, they hadn't got to the point of teaching people. And uh, later, Charles went off to medical school too. Uh, but these young doctors would go to meetings and they were knowledgeable and they could, uh, with good manners, uh, comment on a, a a paper that was presented at a meeting and to good effect uh, uh, say it might be uh, uh, that people thought that cancer was because uh, contagious but they would point out that older people get cancer and you're dealing with younger people in the settlement era uh, so very little cancer, but as the era got older and the people got older, there was more cancer. So the appearance of cancer wasn't because of a, a contagion, it was because the aging process was there. And uh, that sort of uh, commentary had to be delivered very carefully because Otherwise, they would have been oscillated. Uh, uh, so sort of, uh, insisted because they were uh, not doing things according to the traditions. And so they too, as uh, young doctors, went off to uh, Europe and to other places in the US uh, to to uh, watch uh, operations. They weren't so interested in the theory of it as they were in uh, actually op uh, watching operations. And uh, when they came back to the US with knowledge, uh, they would uh, allow people to come and visit if, if they were in a meeting and and it was thought that they were they, they didn't couldn't possibly have a uh, hundred uh, examples of where they had uh, operated were using a certain technique uh, then there would be uh, uh, a comment that uh, this was a very small community it couldn't possibly have that many people uh, operating for a gallbladder or a, a stomach problem it would be uh, uh, so they, their paper would get rejected or their uh, it was not understood but some of the people who were watching the quality of the the commentary by the young doctors and their father uh, were interested in allowing or encouraging people to come see what they were doing and and people were uh, somewhat amazed uh, 
that these young people could could actually uh, take on other people's operational procedure, but improve upon it. And gradually their population of people uh, increased. And it wasn't just for one or two particular operations like stomach was a concern. And if you were going to take out part of the bowel, you had to have some way of connecting the two pieces so that they didn't get gangrene. Uh, the, the, the women were concerned because they would have tremendous cysts that needed to be removed. And uh, somebody had to get game enough to be able to open up a body and remove the cyst. And uh, believe it or not, these people survived and uh, were very grateful. Uh, uh, and and uh, sometimes it was not the stomach that was the problem. It might have been a gallbladder or a, or, or an appendicitis. Uh, uh, so how, how could they encourage this? Well, the elder son could speak very well. And uh, he was eventually invited to meetings and was members of meetings and uh, actually uh, chaired meetings. And uh, he, he uh, not only took their ideas, but he said very loudly and clearly that these weren't necessarily all their own ideas. These were the ideas where they had a, a string around several ideas and their contribution was the, the string and the bow that brought these ideas together. So they were improving on it and, and, and they could tell people and, and people were realizing this. Uh, they uh, uh, sometimes had uh, nabob leading surgeons come and be amazed. So uh, they would do operations and let people watch and much more they would allow uh, for uh, people to move in and actually see what was going on. It's very hard to have a body uh, and have it open and have people see what's going on uh, in minute detail. You can get an idea of the generality, but uh, they would use mirrors and they would uh, have uh, lights so that the people could uh, see what was going on. They uh, sometimes reduced the number of assistants that they had to perhaps one uh, that was providing. The second son was several years younger than the, the, his brother, but they were very much doing things together. They would do the same operation together uh, in unison uh, until it got to be that they had so many operations that they uh, actually had to separate and do things themselves. Uh, but Charlie, the, the younger one, was uh, the one that could work with uh, the, the problem and experiment with it and open up the person and decide that it was not a problem of a stomach, it was a problem that uh, might involve other parts of the body. Uh, it had to be very delicate if it was a goiter, or it had to involve blood vessels and uh, nerves. The brain had to involve uh, details that they didn't know about. And this was all in uh, sort of makeshift studios or in homes. Uh, people would have you come to their home and they would have to set up the kitchen table uh, with that, not a lot of sterilization. That was an early problem. Uh, people would uh, use instruments in a manner that they weren't clean. A pastor hadn't come on the field yet and, and other uh, uh, thoughts of, of cleanliness were not there. But father found out that if you had bleeding in a, in a 
ulcerated area, you could take uh, uh, kerosene and put it on a, a swatch, and that would help to close up the bleeding vessels. And then you would wait while I'll open up again. And, and so little things like that made it possible for others to learn. There were no real medical schools. And this was in the area where you had uh, probably in the 1861, two, three, that area, where there were still Indian tribes in, in uh, Minnesota, and they were assigned to reservations, and those uh, reservations were not being provided with adequate food that was promised. The land had been taken over and they weren't being looked after, so they were challenging the, the Caucasian uh, invaders. So, uh, that got to be a, 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 a real challenge at the same time as there was a, a, a civil war and, and discussion about slavery. Uh, but gradually they solved those problems and some of them were rather serious. You, you didn't know that your friends or relatives were going to be alive next day because uh, it, the Indians knew how to do guerrilla warfare and, and make a statement. And uh, they deserve to be heard. Uh, so uh, so you have two individuals and a father operating very independently, moving across the country, and gradually the population of, of users uh, expanding, the, the uh, Catholic uh, support hospital having to uh, grow uh, and do things that they had never done before. And, uh, uh, there was some intermarrying here. Uh, the, the boys married people who were also uh, very sympathetic and perhaps had brothers who were headed for medicine. And gradually that got to be an in-house event, but almost too many people coming in and almost too many doctors coming to observe. Uh, so they eventually decided that they should uh, put together some sort of association, and that association should include other people. And they invited in other people, and they created uh, a, a will and testament, which would mean that the, the organization would not fail if any one of them died. Uh, that took a lot of doing. Uh, it, had, it had to figure out who was going to owe, own what uh, operation or who was going to be paid. They were very uh, sure that they did not want to charge people who didn't have the money in a depression to uh, pay them. So a lot of the services were free. Uh, and even after the success of an operation, they may be paying for the person to be uh, living somewhere that could be close enough where he could be monitored. Uh, so they eventually had an organization with two or three or not very many more specialists. Uh, some of the specialties that came into action were eyes. People had cataracts and they needed to have cataracts removed. Uh, and Charlie became very good at doing that. But these weren't one dimensional uh, doctors. They, they might do that at one stage and then be 
removing a, 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 a something a gross on a foot at another uh, or doing something with the, the uh, intestine uh, they got to be somewhat specialized in intestines because they seemed to do very well and they they found procedures that would allow the junction of uh, intestines without uh, the fear of uh, gangrene. And they got to realize that uh, sterility was a, a, an important thing and uh, their, their hospital, uh, their rather crude laboratories were kept clean and uh, instead of washing the wound with water uh, that might be contaminated, uh, they uh, drained that out in a more sensible fashion and didn't include a lot of loose uh, uh, possible bacterial infection. Uh, eventually, they had to deal with people coming in. People did not always appreciate their knowledge. Uh, and as we said, Rochester was a small community and how come they had uh, so many experiences with operations, perhaps a hundred in a community that normally wouldn't have that many of that type of operation to be engaged in but it was because the outside was coming in. And in some cases they were going out uh, to communities. Uh, uh, so the next thing was to get the visiting professors, the visiting uh, surgeons uh, to have a, a, a group uh, a, a, a group of associates so that they could talk to each other. And not everyone wanted to do this, but it certainly brought the uh, operational people together. And, uh, so the Mayo people, just three of them, uh, added to was about three others that were a specialist that would uh, be able to handle a, a microscope or uh, special equipment and, and uh, do diagnostic work. Uh, and they would want these people that came in to associate to also go out and, and uh, work with uh, people who needed them. Uh, but also with people who needed their ideas. And uh, uh, so gradually they set up new facilities that were larger. By the time they got built, they were almost too small. Uh, they may have uh, a number of doctors coming to see the same operation. Uh, they would want to see several operations so uh, William would be doing one operation uh, Charles in the next operating room would be doing another and and before these visitors left they may be looking at 30 or 40 different operations and uh, and they were very glad to get that experience and the the hospital nearby was providing uh, respite for these people, but they also wanted to have uh, a, a, an area where they could come together after operations had been seen and, and talk the matters up, you know, whether it just be sociologically or uh, professionally. Uh, so those sorts of friendly uh, activities got expanded uh, and uh, Gradually, this these three piece of people, 
got to be recognized at a regional level and then like Chicago or uh, Philadelphia <coughs> or <clears throat> or other places including uh, Europe. So people were traveling across the Atlantic to visit the Mayo Clinic and uh, uh, the streets were still mud, the parks were small, and the Mayo uh, team was getting to be paid enough by people who could afford it uh, to uh, upgrade the community with various services. First one was a telephone uh, to be able to connect house to house. The, the two brothers had a house next door to each other and they could communicate. They were going to have a telephone connection, but uh, their wives said, no, we, we, we're not going to do this 24 hours a day. So they had a, a speaking tube. And you have to realize this, this was in the 1880s, 1890s. Uh, um, this is when my grandfather was still alive. Uh, uh, and uh, it was in other countries, it, it spread more slowly. But you had to have uh, things like somebody had to provide ambulances. Well, I can remember early ambulances uh, where they were like a, a modified uh, 1928 Chevrolet. Uh, it was a, a buckboard and you could uh, get one patient in the back. Uh, uh, this was early uh, ambulances in Australia and the community had to pay for that. Uh, this was not a national level thing, this was a local thing. And uh, so I always remember ambulance drivers with their hands out at various venues to, to keep the ambulances alive. In the US, there were more entrepreneurial uh, uh, stimulus to create an ambulance so that they could take a patient from an operating theater to the uh, hospital. Uh, and uh, that could be a, a professional thing. Uh, so these people were not only willing to uh, explore, but they were willing to share and they were willing to be involved with the community. And uh, both brothers bounced off of each other. The elder brother was very uh, sure that he wanted to make sure that the public knew that they were a pair uh, and that uh, although Charles was more folksy uh, and, and not out in front quite so much, uh, he was also very essential in a totally different manner. He would, uh, his discussion, his wife had him organized for a presentation that would be organized and, uh, and she would be in the audience and, and egg him on. Uh, but his problem was that he would get to a point and then he would think about a story and he would break off into a story. And people would enjoy that uh, even uh, as he was operating. And, uh, but the wife was rather frustrated at th that, but it was his forte and uh, he got to be recognized for this. And sometimes they would have many uh, visiting uh, scholars watching what he was doing. And he, he would try to tell them exactly what he was doing so that they could follow through. But when he got to a certain point and it meant that somebody else had had some involvement here, perhaps uh, success or failure, he would go into that story and, and uh, 
uh, it was almost as if these people would want the operation to be uh, repeated because there was so much information that they could not handle it all. So uh, scholars would come back annually and gradually that the uh, medical hospitals got to realize that they needed to have medical schools and there was a problem of uneducated uh, unqualified people out there doing uh, medical work without the appropriate uh, credentials uh, and uh, did these people become the teachers uh, not exactly they were teachers when they were demonstrating it in an operating room but not in the theory uh, so gradually there were societies put together and uh, there was some recognition given to this crazy bunch of three people who were prepared to spend their lives working at uh, improving the health services and being very successful at it so they were eventually getting accolades uh, from people who realized the quality of their work whereas some of the older population was not very certain about that uh, that uh, these were young people they looked like teenagers they were probably 20 or 23 or 21 but they were uh, so much younger than the establishment sometimes establishment I couldn't quite follow that uh, but gradually mayo clinic became a focus for the rest of the world and and people would come in regularly uh, uh, early on it was by a horse and buggy gradually the trains came by so you could you could uh, come by train and eventually uh biplanes and uh gradually by 1900 uh, uh there was a flow of people coming in that was quite considerable and uh, this team was being given uh credentials uh, and they were able to uh, be very successful in their speeches or in their operations and and in consideration for working with the communities uh, uh, raising the level of medical awareness uh, uh, it came in stages uh, at the outset one of the real problems was uh, problems with uterine growth uh, that could be solved uh, it involved breast cancer it involved uh, the early stages of uh, graft skin graft and the decision to take a, a breast off and replace it with a graft rather than to have a, a rather de diseased piece of uh, breast that would not heal well uh, and, and gradually these uh, things worked and uh, the stomach one came in because there were lots of problems with people thinking they had digestion and uh, trying to solve that with food or medicine and didn't work uh, but sometimes it was a blockage of a of a alimentary canal uh, and joining it together and uh, so there were periods when one thing was more important than another uh, there were periods when it was discovered that they could actually remove a cataract and people would take their cataract home with them because they wanted to show others that they could now see when they were blind with cataract uh, uh, there were ear nose and throat connections that gradually evolved and so here were theoreticians that were claiming that, that they really weren't the instigators but in fact they were 
uh, bringing things together uh, for for uh, other people to enjoy. Uh, they were kind of on the loner side. Uh, so the nurses and the wives and the children got to be involved some and and the uh, uh, two children lasted up into the late 1930s and uh, the Mayo Clinic has uh, continued with that sort of quality of uh, uh, bringing people to them. Sometimes they go out to people, so there was an input and an output. Uh, sometimes it was total failure if you you went out and the diagnosis had been with a local level person they had to appreciate that that was there but when they opened up the person the, the problem might be a appendicitis and not uh, the stomach uh, so so uh, you might not want to do that sort of operation right away or uh, you, but you had to be very careful not to hurt the original person that did the diagnosis. Uh, there were surgeons who were surgeons that would amputate a leg, but were not knowledgeable about uh, some of the body. So there was a need for, for an education of where the uh, arteries were, where the nerves were. And, and it's, it's interesting to think that this was only a hundred years ago and we've made progress and there's still a, a lot to learn and Mayo Clinic is uh, a center for doing that. Sometimes locally we think that uh, some of the local clinics uh, would like to think of themselves as a uh, Mayo Clinic in this area and that's justified to some extent but it hasn't got that history and that structure and that energy that put together Mayo Clinic. And it's not in a major city. It's not in Chicago. It's not in St. Paul. It's not in Minneapolis. It's, it's not in Wisconsin. But there are outliers of people who uh, are now members of a team of people who have been to share uh, this sort of information. And uh, uh, the, the uh, Mayo family has been very uh, uh, humble in the way they have worked. This has not been a competition. This has been uh, progress uh, and experimentation and intelligence and uh, dependent on people who uh, are willing to to work and also be de 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 dependent uh, <coughs> and uh, independent in the work uh, the <coughs> the woman who was doing the, the wife who was doing the uh, i think it was the uh, one of the directors of the a Catholic institution who are getting to be so good at doing anesthesia that they were encouraged to go out. And so this is some of the first uh, opportunities that women had to, to do much more than be at home and, and uh, producing families. This was uh, making uh, excellent use of people's minds that didn't always get that chance. Uh, so I wanted to to bring that together. I, I haven't finished reading the book yet because it uh, finishes with the passing of the two brothers. Uh, and it's been repeated, edited. Uh, there are various editions uh, f for many years ahead. It's, uh, the woman that did it was selected by the University of Minnesota. Her name is 
clap and clap and settle. It's an unusual name, but uh, there's a story about it. Uh, the Mayo Clinic people would take people down the Mississippi uh, for a, a sort of a business get together. And some of the university preacher or people approached this these family and said uh, the the actually the hosts and said we would like to make a history of your organization and they said well we've been approached a lot of times to do that but it seems to be a, a fairly rough tough uh, estimate of what we do and. Uh, uh, we prefer not to do that. And uh, the university said, the university chancellor said, uh, you have done enough that you don't really own your own history. This is something that is beyond you and it should be recorded. And we think that if the university were to make a record of what you, your father and your brother and your family has done. Uh, this would be a contribution that, that's important and, and we would guarantee it to be written properly. So they appointed, the university appointed uh, Helen Clapp and settle and and uh, she wrote this starting about 1934 and she was allowed to interview the people sometimes they didn't interview modern employees but eventually when that it was an important part of development uh, they did that too and the book that I'm reading is an abbreviation and it's like 400 500 pages and this is a, a, a summary uh, because the book got to be rather popular and uh, has had many uh, reproductions but there is still the original information so if you are a historian and if you want to follow the the, the uh, Mayo family you can do so in tomes that are uh, probably too much for the general surgeon, the public, or even people who are organizing. Uh, there was an era when the railroads were very concerned about some of this. Uh, they were putting in railroads, but they were having accidents and they had to have uh, appointees who uh, knew something about uh, public health and they had to have administrators who would bring together those people and uh, then there had to be governmental involvement to see that something correct was going on and so all that uh, had to be recorded and uh, I, I think that's worth reporting uh, to to uh, uh, your uh, involvement uh, just think of the parallels with natural history and the things that we talk about that are environmental. I think we're getting to the end of the program. I thank you for listening. Think about what you do with your mind and action. And it can be very small, but it can be quite significant. So uh, onward and upward. This is Dave Monk, Gilberry Monk, WFT Champagne 90.1 on your FM dial. And think about WEFT as one of those agencies that in 40 years has survived and brings you information, especially about community affairs and music that's, that where experts come in and they know their onions and can tell you and give you an excitement about music that's not always available on other broadcast media. Thank you.